business jets that travel five times the speed of sound and an at-home jet hangar next to your garage. Plush airborne office suites and cabin walls lined with imported silk. Homemade jets for under a million dollars and advice on buying previously owned jets from a Klingon. Now, Private Jets on Modern Marvels. When it comes to jets, there are always those who are driven to leave the beaten path. Who seek to own the unique, the unusual, the exclusive one and only. One way to accomplish this is with a jet conversion. For example, you can buy a new private jet and have it flown to a conversion center where they will install a custom interior. Or, you can pick up a previously owned jet and let a conversion center upgrade the avionics and the interior. You can even buy used military jets that are already converted to meet current FAA standards. That's what Michael Dorn did. If you don't recognize him without his makeup, he's the Klingon Lieutenant Worf from the popular television and film series Star Trek The Next Generation. Michael's also been an armchair expert on aviation for 30 years, a pilot for almost 15, and has been flying jets since 1992. I've gone from regular airplanes, Cessna single engines, to twins, to uh, jets, uh, to military jets, ex-military jets. I had a T-33, uh, an F-86. My passion is military jets right now. The first professionally converted military planes were World War II bombers and transports that were made into corporate carriers for VIPs. The first large jet converted for private use was a 707 in 1961. It became known as Air Force One. In the 50s, North American uh, came up with the idea of taking the Sabre jet, which was a very popular and very strong design and make a passenger jet for the military, uh, for the Air Force. And if you look at this airplane and the F-86, you'll see same designs in terms of the wing and the landing gear. So they took all the best things about the Sabre jet and incorporated this airplane. The Sabre liner also offers a very roomy cockpit, as well as remarkable speed and range. It does 0.82 Mach, which is 0.82 percentage speed of sound, all day long. It has a high ceiling. It can go up to 43, 45,000. And also, the range is about 1,400 miles. So it's one stop cross country, either way, no matter what winds you have. Although the Learjet, which is the other airplane I was looking at, has this blazing speed off the ground, once this airplane gets going, uh, it is just as fast. If you're considering the purchase of a previously owned jet, Michael has some advice. When you are thinking about an aircraft like this, you can either do one of two things. You either go to a broker that you know, or you can uh, go and trade a plane, which is a periodical, or you can go into aircraft.com on the internet or uh, the controller, which is another magazine that's, uh, that's big for these airplanes. Next, decide on your mission, where you intend to fly. Will you be traveling under 800 miles or more than 1,000 per trip? And once you decide on the aircraft, call up the guy, start haggling. That's what you have a broker for. And if you're smart, you will have a pre-buy inspection where they take the airplane, tear it apart, inspect it, make sure everything's there, everything works. And then you go back to the person. You say, OK, I want it, or let's talk some more. And that's how you do it. The inspection is something you pay for, but it's worth it to know what condition your jet is in. Michael's Sabre liner was already upgraded with air conditioning that works on the ground, autopilot, and a global positioning system. According to Michael, a vintage jet aircraft like this Sabre liner could sell for between $350,000 and $800,000. The best part about these airplanes is the convenience that it gives you. You don't have to deal with the baggage carousel, you don't have to deal with going through the terminal. 
Plus, you can get closer to your destination. You don't have to fly into the big airports. You can fly into the little ones outlying, the kind of little satellite airports. If you are not someone with a passion for flying the older converted military and commercial jets, if you want something brand new, a conversion that's luxurious with state-of-the-art avionics, and you're willing to spend a lot of money, consider the Associated Air Center in Dallas, Texas, a company that creates very high-end, lavish jet interiors for their customers. We rely for the most part on the customer bringing to us an aircraft. And uh, you can buy it brand new from Boeing or Airbus, or you can buy it from a leasing company. Once the new owner has made the initial jet purchase, the aircraft is flown to the Associated Air Center at Love Field in Dallas. We have done what we call the nose to tail conversions in which we take a regular airliner, which already comes with lavatories and galleys and uh, sidewalls and bins and so forth. And then we upgrade it. We convert it into a VIP. This is where you will give your Boeing BBJ or Airbus ACJ the royal treatment as the Associated Air Center guides you through the decision process. First you get a reading from the customer, what do you want your aircraft for? It's, uh, it's long range, short range. Do you want a bedroom or you rather have a lounge or a meeting area, a dining area? Then we try to get an idea of the budget uh, that the customer has in order to start picking fabrics and stones and uh, veneers and finishes and plating of the metal parts. Another area that is very important to our customers is the entertainment. So we sit down and try to define how many sources, how many viewing areas, how many monitors, if any. Ron Tudor, president of the Tudor Saliba Corporation, an international construction company, wanted an elegantly outfitted Boeing BBJ to use for both his family and his business. He sent his jet to the Associated Air Center. The engineers and designers turned the BBJ's empty interior into a luxurious airborne home. For a family of four that could also double as an airborne office, conference room, and hotel suite. The main lounge is designed for 12 people with all kinds of great toys. The aircraft is equipped with four video monitors, two 42-inch plasma screen monitors, one in the main cabin, one in the uh, master stateroom. Videos uh, via DVD or VHS are available. You can watch two separate videos at any time. We have a sophisticated audio system where you can play multiple CDs, with headphones at different listening stations or speakers throughout the cabin. The galley is a state-of-the-art gourmet kitchen with a gas range, microwave, dishwasher, convection oven, and cappuccino maker. And a flight attendant who also happens to be a first-rate chef. Between the main lounge and galley is a marble wet bar that's fully stocked. Then right behind it has a guest lavatory and uh, what we call a kid's room for the principal's uh, children. And then the, the master suite with, uh, has a big bedroom and a big lavatory with a shower. So it's set up more like a home, away from home. In my nine years with the company and 30 years in the business, I don't recall uh, ever doing two airplanes alike. And basically that's what people are looking for, the, the exclusive, the, the personal touch. The cost of this type of conversion will run between 12 and 15 million dollars. 
But if you don't happen to have the price of a new BBJ and another 15 million for the custom interior, consider a do-it-yourself jet. At Maverick Air in Fremont, Colorado, they're hard at work creating a twin jet aircraft you can build from a kit with an estimated range of about a thousand miles. It will cruise at a maximum speed of 440 miles per hour. With a service ceiling of 30,000 feet, this kit also includes a pressurized cabin. If you're looking to build your own jet, plan on spending in the neighborhood of $650,000, depending on who assembles it. Previously owned and kit-built jets open the jet ownership market to a broader range of consumers. But when it comes to spending money in the tens of millions of dollars, expensive interior jet conversions are just the beginning. Next, high-end megabucks transatlantic private jets, flying offices for the Fortune 500. When it comes to high-end business jet travelers, there is a new must-have. Private jets the size of giant commercial airliners. These office suites in the sky are capable of traveling across whole continents and oceans without refueling. The most popular are built by Boeing, Bombardier, Gulfstream, and Airbus. Some of these companies won't even discuss price, unless you're a serious buyer. But figure these aircraft will cost anywhere between 35 to 50 million dollars. So, who buys these lavish airborne corporate suites? And are they worth it? I, I think there's a myth about who really owns these, op these aircraft. First of all, most celebrities, unless the, the very select few, don't own these aircraft. They use them. They're either provided by agents or owners or uh, studios to get people around. The real owners and operators of these aircraft are people that run large and mid-sized corporations who have many business interests that need to get around. Heads of state are also among the clientele. In the late 1990s, Kuwait Airways bought three Gulfstream 5s for that country's senior government officials. A Gulfstream 3 or C-20 was assigned to General Norman Schwarzkopf at the beginning of Desert Shield, which became Desert Storm. It was uh, given to him on a 24-hour-a-day, seven-day-a-week basis. It became his flying office, his command center, and the best way for him to communicate with the military leaders and advisors of all of the Mideastern countries. The concept of this uh, flying corporate office uh, obviously appeals to some people. It's, it's phenomenal how big it is, how roomy it is. You can have conferences going on in one conference room. You could set up another conference room. You could have secretarial staff in there taking care of things. Your uh, data links uh, to corporate headquarters to make sure you're connected. Uh, you can take the show on the road. That road might be an airborne highway that takes a top management team from Los Angeles all the way to Paris, London, or Rome, or from New York to Tokyo, non-stop. The first of these super long-range business aircraft to hit the market was the Gulfstream 5 in 1997. The Seagram Company was its first customer. The G5 was followed by Bombardier's Global Express, then the Boeing business jet, the European manufactured Airbus A319 corporate jetliner became available in late 1997. The Airbus corporate jet is comparable in size, function and price to the BBJ. Although with 6,000 cubic feet of living space, it is a bit larger. But there are other differences, like its Category 3B all-weather landing system, used for low visibility landings, 50 meter runway visual range, an important operational capability that's not found on many commercial airliners or corporate jets. 
The Boeing business jet, or BBJ, is a deluxe version of its 737 commercial jet, designed especially for corporate and VIP clients. Inside the cabin, there are 807 square feet of floor space, larger than some apartments. To expand the range on the Boeing business jet, they've added winglets. This increases the airflow over the wing, which steps up the efficiency by approximately 5%, making it possible for the BBJ to land in less than 6,000 feet of runway. But that's not all. It's equipped with TCAS, which is Traffic Collision Avoidance System. It lets us uh, see other aircraft in our vicinity to avoid them. It is uh, also equipped with wind shear avoidance system. In weather conditions, it uh, might be dangerous to the aircraft. It alerts us prior to us entering those. The addition of auxiliary fuel tanks provides owners with a business jet that has a maximum range capability of 7,100 miles. Bombardier, the company that bought Learjet back in 1992, also builds another business jet, the Global Express. It has an overall length of 99 feet and a wingspan of 94 feet and is the only aircraft in this class that's built from scratch. The others are modified versions of aircraft that already exist. The Global Express is really the pinnacle of aviation technology. It's got triple redundancy in all of its systems. It's been designed because of its long range to be able to fly over not only the Atlantic, but the Pacific Ocean. So it's got to be able to conform to all of the requirements for extended range operation of a two-engine aircraft over long expanses of water. Triple redundancy is a safety feature that means in the event of a failure of any system, there's always a backup of two systems so that the aircraft is able to fly safely and continue on its journey. It's got onboard computers that can help do diagnosis of any technical faults that exist and communicate those automatically to ground stations so that if a repair is required or a part is required, that part can be dispatched or shipped while the aircraft is still en route to its original destination. That technology will enable us to keep people's schedules and trips uninterrupted, even though there will be some technical problems from time to time. The Global Express also has the highest technology wing in the industry, what it calls a supercritical wing. It's able to be very flexible in flight. So it has a, a movable leading edge and a trailing edge, which allows it to be very flexible on takeoff and to take off at very low speeds. This corporate jet will take off at slightly more than 100 miles per hour even though it cruises at nearly 600 miles an hour. So as I like to say, the Global Express can float like a butterfly because it's very docile, but can fly at very high speeds because after you take off and climb, it's able to reshape the wing to a very efficient cruising structure. It gets into very small fields, very comfortably, needs very little room to land. The fourth corporate jet in this category is the Gulfstream 5. Inside the cabin, it's just over 50 feet long and seven and a half feet wide. Plenty of room for the Gulfstream design team to create its plush interior to the client's specifications. Upholstered walls and ceilings, rare wood and marble veneers, luxurious leather seating and anything from calfskin to iguana, even the commode in the lavatory is covered in leather. When it comes to any of these massive jets, the buyer can get just about anything he wants. A discotheque was installed in one. Um, they have been uh, flying uh, party rooms, but also they have been the most strategic military communication centers you can imagine. So the whole gambit of uh, serious to uh, frivolous have been involved in Gulfstream interiors over the years. These massive corporate jets are the ideal rich person's charter. With the boom in private jet ownership comes another trend. Well-appointed private terminals. Go ahead for customer service. 
In the quiet, plush atmosphere of this private terminal in Dallas, passengers who may be traveling together can meet, or just relax if they arrive a little early for takeoff. And because of its smaller size and light passenger traffic, these smaller terminals are easier for security personnel to police. All in all, these long-range business jets give corporate flyers the freedom to dash into some of the more remote locations in the world, quickly and securely. You're with passengers that you know and work with in most cases. The pilots are your own. They're trained by your own organization, paid for by your own corporation. They've been flying with you for many, many years. They load your baggage. They unload your baggage. They lock the doors for you. They give you the safety briefings. It's a, it's a very comforting uh, environment for the corporate uh, passenger. In the past, all of this personal attention was just another great byproduct of private jet ownership. But in an era of increasing insecurity about the safety of air travel, these extras give business jet travelers something more. Peace of mind. Next, parking your private jet next to your house. And buying a jet timeshare. In January 2001, Super Bowl 35 was held in Tampa, Florida. On the Friday before the game, there were 73 parking reservations for private and corporate jets that expected to land at Tampa's International Airport. And another 1,000 charter aircraft planning to park. It seems that finding a place to park your private jet has never been more difficult. Especially if you use your jet for work and play. So, if you're looking to have your own personal private jet parking space, the answer might be a fly-in community. A fly-in community is a place where homeowners have hangars either beside or near their houses, with taxiways that lead to an adjacent airport. A well-kept secret these unique communities have been havens for private prop plane owners since the early 1970s. A decade earlier, McKinley Conway, a pilot, aeronautical engineer, and futurist, saw a way to take abandoned military airfields and turn them into residential communities for pilots and their families. In 1969, Conway developed the first total fly-in community near Daytona Beach, Florida on just such an airfield. Called Spruce Creek, today it has 800 residents, all prop plane owners. Because of the noise, jets aren't allowed. But jet owners are beginning to invade a few fly-in communities, like this one in Pine Mountain Lake, California, just 26 miles west of the entrance to Yosemite National Park. I've always been accused of uh, living at the airport, and uh, I always wanted a house on an airport, and I have one now, with a hangar uh, in back, and I can taxi a, a Learjet right into the hangar, and I can leave uh, Van Nuys Airport and 37 minutes later uh, uh, be here. At least one-third of the residents at Pine Mountain Lake have a driveway in back of their house, and a taxiway in front. There are over 400 fly-in communities that currently exist in the U.S. By necessity, the runways were short, 3,200 feet at the longest. Not a problem for smaller propeller planes. But jets have always required more runway simply because they take off and land at higher rates of speed. Fully fueled, a private jet will need to reach a speed of 150 miles per hour on takeoff no matter how big the passenger load. The Learjet that we flew today has a slowdown wing on it that reduced the stall speed by 10 miles an hour. It can land on a short runway. The book shows that it'll land on a runway down to 3,000 feet, but you can't do it at full gross weight. So uh, when you fly into a smaller airport, you have to be at less weight, and you can't take off with enough fuel to fly halfway across the country. And, uh, it's one of the areas that uh, all manufacturers are really considering now and shooting for because people do want to uh, go into smaller airports. 
there are only a handful of flying communities prepared to accept jet aircraft. With private jet ownership on the increase, experts like Clay Lacey believe that's bound to change. But what if you or your company can't afford your own private jet, let alone a house with its own hangar? There are a few alternatives, like fractional jet ownership. Everyone in the aviation industry says this is, without question, the hottest new idea in air travel. The arrangement works something like a timeshare. Corporations can buy an eighth or a sixteenth or a quarter share of a very expensive jet, use it a hundred hours a year and pay a monthly service fee and not have uh, any of the flight crew requirements or training or anything else involved with jet ownership. Legendary investment guru and billionaire Warren Buffett believed so strongly in the growth potential of fractional jet ownership that in 1998 Buffett purchased Executive Jet Incorporated and its NetJet's fractional aircraft ownership program. You know, when you get a chance to buy the best company by far and a company in an industry that's going to go gangbusters, I mean, you better sign the check. <laughs> Surprisingly, this idea has been around for at least 15 years. In 1986, Richard Santulli, the chairman and CEO of Executive Jet, introduced the concept of fractional aircraft ownership. He called that concept NetJets because his vision would be that NetJets would be a network of business jets that would first blanket the U.S., Europe, and then the balance of the world. One advantage of fractional aircraft ownership is that it allows customers to purchase the exact amount of annual flight hours they might need. We sit with our NetJet owners as they are evaluating what their flying needs are, and we help them determine, do they need 50 hours a year? Do they need 100 hours a year? Do they need 150 or 200 hours a year? With 12 different aircraft types to choose from, customers get a chance to sample most of the mainstream private jets on the market. For a fellow like myself, who has a 500-mile mission one day and a 1,500-mile mission another day and sometimes takes a lot of people with him, sometimes travels alone, uh, fractional ownership just makes nothing but sense. Next, how to choose the fractional jet that fits just right. Since the late 1950s, the private jet has been the ultimate symbol of wealth and prestige. But the supreme status symbol became more accessible in 1986, when a company called NetJets introduced the idea of fractional ownership, allowing companies and individuals to buy timeshares in private jets that suit many different needs. The type of jet is dictated by the length of the trip. A Gulfstream 5 or a Boeing BBJ would be the perfect aircraft for an intercontinental flight from New York to Milan. Or New York to Moscow, non-stop. But a trip from Columbus, Ohio to Newark, New Jersey doesn't require an aircraft that's designed for intercontinental travel. A Citation 5 Ultra would do the job for much less money, without giving up any comforts. This company maintains a database that manages a vast array of information, from the kind of food a client likes to advanced weather monitoring. And that program is designed to handle everything it takes to provide our owners the best, most convenient, safest flight we possibly can. From ordering their aircraft, to providing catering, to providing direction and guidance to our pilots as to destinations, to using our meteorologists to help map out the best route that particular day for that particular flight. The equipment we use is technologically advanced and it allows us to look at products in a little bit different way. And that will allow the individual meteorologist to tailor the information of what he needs on a daily basis to accomplish those three factors of safety, passenger comfort, and economy of the flight. Of course, the fees for all this aren't exactly lunch money. Let's say you want to fly 50 hours a year in a light jet that has a cost of $6 million for the entire aircraft, 
At NetJets, you can purchase a 1 16th ownership interest in that $6 million jet for as little as $375,000. In addition, there is a monthly management fee and an hourly fee for each hour you fly. Reasonable catering is included at no additional charge on small and mid-size aircraft. But maybe you aren't quite ready to commit to a timeshare. If that's the case, there's a way to sample all the comforts of a business charter with a minimum of expense. Hi, this is Dan at Skyjet. How can I help you? Dan, it's called Skyjet.com. They offer an online service that lets customers buy unused seats on corporate charter flights. You should have that within a half an hour. What Skyjet is, is a central place uh, using the internet uh, where customers and suppliers of aircraft can come together. Our basic mission is to make uh, using a business jet as easy as it is to book a commercial jet. Trevor Cornwell knew there were close to 1,500 jets all across the country that were available for charter. But nobody knew where they all were at any one time. The, uh, time on it. He discovered a way to collect that information and put it into a user-friendly database. For example, a corporate flight might carry a group of executives from New York to Los Angeles for a week-long business conference. They're going to spend a week in L.A. That plane doesn't just sit there. It flies back to its home, and then it returns back to pick up the customer. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the magic place uh, in, in business jets, because you can actually book a trip on that empty leg or dead leg when the plane is flying back from where it's dropped off a customer. We've set up an auction system where you can go in and you can say, I want to take that L.A. to New York flight, and this is how much I'm willing to pay for it. If he can't do it for me, I'll The highest bid wins the seat on the corporate jet. That will get it in at the same price, if not better. Where are you leaving from? We'll fly down with you. Skyjet.com uses the Internet as a supply chain management tool that can pinpoint available seats on business jets all across the country. And we created very simple software which allows a customer to be able to put in uh, to the system, into the internet or through our uh, reservation center, a set of city pairs or an itinerary um, saying that they want to go from here to there on such and such a date. And then our software generates uh, for that customer a list of the best aircraft available for them. Whatever your choice, buying a fraction of a high-end business jet or reserving your own charter flight. The chance to get in on corporate jet travel has never been more promising. Next, NASA's revolutionary new airline system with jet-powered air taxis and smart airports. And visionary aircraft developer Burt Rutan on the future of private jets. In 1903, as Orville and Wilbur Wright struggled to get their canvas and wooden airplane to take flight, it is unlikely that either of them could have imagined the future they were setting in motion. Pilotless jets programmed to avoid collisions in the air as well as to take off and land themselves at smart airports. And hypersonic travel made possible by air-breathing scramjet technology that plucks the oxygen it needs for combustion right out of the atmosphere. A far cry from today's air transportation system. We've had airliners for roughly 65 years. Airline travel. I believe 65 years from now, <laughs> we'll look back and say that was kind of a phase that we went through. It worked for the time being. It got initially clumsy, and then it got overtaken by other technologies. Gulfstream has not given up on its dream for a supersonic business jet. They have preliminary designs in the works and are working with major engine manufacturers to find a combination that may be suitable for a corporate business jet. Many people think that we should skip the 1.2 to 1.6 Mach speeds and go right to a hypersonic business jet. A hypersonic aircraft would travel at a maximum speed of Mach 10. That's 10 times the speed that sound waves travel. Or 
an incredible 7,420 miles per hour. To achieve this, NASA is developing technology for air-breathing engines called scramjets that actually scoop air out of the atmosphere and use it to combust the fuel. For the moment, making the trip from San Francisco to Atlanta or New York to LA in half an hour is little more than a dream for travelers with impossibly hectic schedules. But aircraft companies are looking into it. NASA has also been quietly developing a revolutionary national airline system design. They call it SATS, Small Airport Transportation System. And if it's implemented, the number of private jets will increase substantially. SATS will have a different look, touch, and feel to it than uh, flying in the hub and spoke system. Uh, you'll be able to go from 10 times as many origins to 10 times as many destinations. With the current hub and spoke system, in order to fly from Los Angeles to Miami, you might begin your day with a long drive to LAX. But instead of flying directly to Miami, you might have to change planes in Dallas-Fort Worth or St. Louis or even San Francisco, depending upon which airline you choose. That adds even more hours to your travel time. Suddenly, a trip that should take five hours is taking 10 or 12. With SATS, you'll be able to fly directly from a small airport near your home or office to a small airport near your destination, saving as much as five hours or more. In the beginning, these small airports, which already exist all over the United States, would be served by a fleet of air taxis, small jets making short hops of under 500 miles. In fact, Eclipse Aviation of Albuquerque, New Mexico is in the final stages of refining and testing its Eclipse 500, a six-seat entry-level twin jet with a projected selling price of only $838,000. These aircraft will be used to operate air taxi services throughout North and South America. NASA estimates that within 10 years, we'll see a significant change in the way we travel by air. The way SATs would work um, in the future as we envision it is that you'll open up your cell phone or your digital uh, communicator pocket device. There will be an icon on the screen. So you hit that and the screen will open up and the screen will say, ah, I see that you're in uh, the San Fernando Valley area and the closest airport to you is only about a mile and a half away. Um, would you like to leave from there? A message comes back and says, we can pick you up in two and a half hours. There are two other people who want to go to Grand Rapids. And if you're willing to fly with these folks, uh, the, the price of the ticket will be, you know, and it'll print it out. And you want to do that, yes or no? And, uh, you know, by uh, six o'clock or so in the evening, you're in Grand Rapids. The aircraft, as well as the airports, will be smart, meaning the computers will be able to speak to each other making takeoffs and landings the business of computers, not air traffic controllers and pilots. The computer in the airplane knows where you want to go. It actually computes a highway in the sky for you. And that highway in the sky appears on the screen in some form as an intuitive graphic depiction of the flight path you are to follow. And that uh, computation has solved the problems for you associated with where's the weather, where's the traffic, Where's the terrain? Where are the obstacles? Where do I need to go next? The FAA and the American aviation industry are cooperating with this effort. NASA figures that SATs will reduce transportation times to more communities by half in 10 years and by two thirds in 25 years. But the immediate future of private jets may look like this prototype, built and tested by visionary aircraft developer Bert Rutan for Visionaire of St. Louis, Missouri. The aircraft is called the Vantage. We set out to build an aircraft that was both fast, affordable, uh, comfortable, but also one that was environmental friendly. We wanted to make sure that uh, from a sound standpoint, uh, that we could go in and out of small cities, uh, large cities, and not interrupt the people. 
In order to accomplish this, Visionaire chose a Pratt Whitney JT15D5 turbofan or fan jet engine, known for being extremely quiet. They also decided on a single jet engine with dual intakes rather than twin jets. Jet engines are so reliable that a single engine business jet would still be many times safer than even a twin engine airplane that has propellers. For one thing, if you have a single engine airplane, the FAA requires you to design it so that its stall speed or minimum flying speed is relatively low. And what that means is if you become a glider and you land out in a field somewhere, your chances of survival are very good compared to very poor if you land real fast like a common business jet. While several aircraft companies build their jets fuselage entirely out of composite materials, the Vantage will be the first all composite business jet. The composite construction techniques use computer-controlled automated machines to literally weave the structure from individual carbon fiber threads over a composite epoxy honeycomb core. The Vantage's airframe is composed of this material that is then crafted into a seamless fuselage. You can mold this in very large parts and therefore you don't need all the rivets that you use in another airplane where you have to use a lot of smaller parts. And with composites, you can get a beautiful compound curves, so it makes a far more aerodynamic airplane. It's really the wave of the future as far as we're concerned in general aviation aircraft. With six passengers and one pilot, it will have a range of a thousand miles at a maximum cruise speed of over 400 miles per hour. It will fly up to 41,000 feet, which takes it higher than most weather and it will land on a runway that's only 2,500 feet long. We feel that there's a tremendous future going forward for private uh, business jet, but also uh, there are going to be personal jets uh, that sell for about half of what this jet does. And as we look to the future, we're going to see many, many thousands of jets built. And in fact, uh, we'll start seeing people trained in jets rather than in propeller aircraft. But with smaller jets, more airports, and an increase in air traffic, there's always the question, won't the skies become too crowded? Some people think they're too crowded already. <laughs> Anyone that says the skies are crowded, ask them to run outside and look up. Anywhere. And in the most congested areas, uh, on a very clear day, when you can see 20,000 cubic miles of air, you might see two airplanes, at the most three. But what about a more distant future? Bert Rutan envisions small future airports that operate something like aircraft carriers. Currently, an aircraft carrier wastes the energy from trapping an aircraft as it lands. Rutan believes this energy can be used. Essentially, you can put uh, 20 airports right downtown just by stacking them and an airplane comes in and is decelerated in two or three hundred feet and then the energy of decelerating that airplane is used to accelerate the next airplane and that can be done much quieter much more convenient in a single century we progressed from horses and buckboards to two cars in every garage whatever the long-range future of private jets it is clear that the way we use large airliners and airport hubs today is in a state of transformation. Private jet ownership may write the next chapter in our transportation history. In a sense, we put wheels on America in the last century. Now, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to picture that in the 21st century, in a like way, we could put wings on America. Next on History. It's amazing what technologies folks came up with to get across the prairie. Take the wind wagon, for example. Basically an eight-foot-long boat with wheels. When the wind was whipping, you were literally sailing. When it wasn't, all you could do was push. Navigating the Road West on Wild West Tech. Next on the History Channel.